Carnegie Mellon University's advanced database systems course is filmed in front of a live studio audience. Again, starting at the bottom of, of the system stack of this conceptual database system we've been building and sort of work our way up to actually be able to start query, running queries and, and producing results. So we're going to start at the very bottom of the system and, and describe what is the data actually going to look like. So uh, the first thing we need to understand is, again, just remind ourselves what workload we're targeting. Right? We've been talking about these OLAP systems, uh, and their workload is going to look different than an OLTP system. And that's going to inform us how we want to design, again, the, the, da the data, uh, how we want to lay out data on the disk or, or in memory, and then, again, all the auxiliary things we need to do to support that. So the primary thing, we're, primary uh, sort of access method or, or access pattern we're going to have in a OLAP workload is going to be sequential scans, meaning we're going to not, we're going to be taking large chunks of data and scanning some subset of the columns that may be in the table, but just, again, scanning large segments of them at a time. And therefore, we're going to have to do a bunch of stuff to make sure that runs as fast as possible. There isn't going to be, uh, typically, there isn't going to be a data structure like a, like a B plus tree or a uh, skip list or other things you would you want to use to help us uh, find individual tuples because we don't care about individual tuples in OLAP workload. We care about aggregate information. We care about sequential scans. And the only time we were, we're ever going to care about finding individual tuples is if we have to stitch the results back together, right? Because we're going to use a decomposition storage model or, or column store, right? Where we're going to break up the attributes for a single tuple. And that's fine because a lot of the processing we'll do in our sequential scans will be, again, on a subset of those columns. But at the end, when we need to produce a final result, we may need to go find the other tuples, or sorry, other attributes for a given tuple and put things back together. But we're not going to want to use a, again, a, a B plus tree or an other data structure to do that for us, like a hash table. Again, just to contrast and remind ourselves from last semester, in an OLTP environment, OLTP workloads, they care about finding individual things, right? Go find Andy's order orders. Go find Andy's you know, bank account. And in, this, in, th in that world, we want to use, again, like something like a P plus tree, be able to go find those things efficiently. And because OLTP systems also need to be able to support updates, inserts, updates, deletes, these data structures have to be uh, dynamic, right? automatically resize themselves as we insert new, new data. Right? We don't care about any of those things in, in our world. Yes? So by stitching, why would we need to do it at the very end? Why would we want to this question is, why, why would I have to do stitching at the very end? That's late materialization, which will cover two weeks. Yeah. But that's the basic idea is that like, I want to I, I avoid having to stitch the tuple together for as long as possible, because I don't know whether I'm going to need even that tuple as I'm going up the query plan. So if I can hold off actually needing to put it back together to the very end, then I avoid un unnecessary I.O. I think I misunderstand what stitch means. Like, so like, Again, it's going to be a column store. This, that's what the, today's talk is about. We're going to break up a tuple into different attributes. We've got to put it back together at the end. Stitch. Okay. Question? Oh, my question was just like, um, if we are not like using indices at all, like over like the the OLAP workloads. Yes. Like, how do we like if we, if we go through like the like sequential scan, find all the tuples that we want from the system idea? Are we passing like up the tuple as we see it, and we're like we want that, or is it like later? Yes. Yeah, so the question is like, how we actually how can we stitch things back together? Like what additional metadata we need to know is like, hey, you're, you're part of this tuple, put that together. We'll cover that later. The basic idea is that you do just record offsets. Good, that, that's, that's the query processing, that's later. All right, so, um, okay, so if all we're gonna, if all we're gonna do uh, for, for OLAP workloads is mostly run sequential scans, now again, it's not entirely true. Sometimes there's you know, smaller range scans, we don't scan the entire thing. Sometimes you do need to go find individual tuples, right? And for all that, we would have additional things we, we could add to our, da our database system. But for now, we're, we're going to ignore that. Right? So if, if all you're going to do is next central scans, you know, what how can you actually optimize it? So this list here is basically what we covered a lot, or we, we talked about a little bit about in the intro class, but a lot of these other things we're going to talk about in this class. Right? This is basically the menu of what's available to us. Right? So today's class is about data encoding and compression how to, to minimize the amount of storage space it takes to represent data, represent tuples. Um, 
Prefetching is identifying what data I'm going to need uh, as I'm scanning along the table and go ahead and, pre and bring those things into memory before the, before the execution engine actually needs it. So when it goes and says, hey, I need this block, voila, it's already here in memory or already in a, a local cache for us. Parallelization is going to allow us to run multiple queries at the same time and within that single query run multiple tasks or query plan fragments or different portions of a query plan at the same time, either across different threads, different processes, different nodes, kind of doesn't matter. Clustering and sorting is identifying that the, the data can be stored in such a way that when queries go, you know, start asking for data within a given range or something, you can minimize the amount of data you have to look at because you know the within some range it's located uh, spatially close to each other. Um, late materialization is what he was asking about. How do I, can I, can I delay having to stitch the tuple back together until the very end? Because I don't want to pay the cost of going reading things from disk or from, you know, from memory if I, if I know I'm actually not going to need it. And I don't need to materialize, you know, take up memory to put things together either. Materialized views of result caching is basically identifying that I'm going to execute basically the same query over and over again. Therefore, I could keep the result of that query around. And that way, when someone asks for it again, it's already there. Or materialized view is a sort of a specialized case of this where you recognize that there's a bunch of queries that need to, ex need to uh, operate or process the same subset of data. Like, give me all the orders within today, you know, today's month or you know, this month. So maybe I could pre-compute that portion of the query for the, give me all the orders for, today's, for this month. And even though the queries may, may do different things on that month's worth of data, right, I've already done sort of the, the basic work of, of, of getting the month. Yes? How is that different from like the data cube stuff? Like the same this question is, how is it different than the data cube stuff? So it's, it's basically the same thing. In the data cube world, back in the day, even now, they're probably not all uh, very dynamic. But like, you basically have to manually refresh. And materialized view, at least the, uh, the idea is that if I make incremental changes, I can then refresh the, the view. Now, I, in the ideal case, you want to do this without uh, recomputing the entire query, because that's the dumbest thing you can do, right? Like, if I insert one tuple, do I want to recompute this you know, you know, one second query or 10 second query? No, there are some systems that can do incremental updates. Admittedly, this is the part of data systems I know the least about. This is super hard. Uh, and we're actually not going to cover that this semester. Um, result caching is obvious. You just do pattern matching on the string and say, hey, it's the same thing, and then reuse it. Uh, this is not that common either. Um, data skipping is being able to identify before actually looking at the data that I don't need the data and uh, you know, not have to process it. Data parallelization or vectorization, this is going to be it's a sort of specialization of par regular parallelization or task parallelization. The idea here is that within a single uh, piece of data, can I, or, or yeah, a chunk of data, maybe multiple tuples, can I, can I use things like SIMD to, do multiple, to, sort of, uh, to process multiple units at the same time or multiple pieces of data at the same time? And then code specialization uh, compilation, well, again, we'll cover this later in the semester. This is the idea is that I, I, since I'm, I, if I know the type of data I'm processing, I know what the query is going to be, Rather than have this engine or execution engine interpret what the query wants to do, I could just literally generate C code that does exactly what the query wants, compile that, and then run that. It doesn't have to be C. You could use intermediate languages and things like that. Um, but th this will be a big thing that we'll, that we'll cover later on. So again, for this semester, we're going to not talk about materialized views, and we're not going to talk about uh, the, uh, the prefetching one. Um, and so for this class, though, we're going to talk about, like this lecture today, we're going to talk about data encoding compression. And then the data encoding part is going to then help us for next class to talk about how can we encode data in such a way that we can get better parallelism uh, through vectorization. Yes? Can I get the summary of materialized views again? This question is, can I get the summary of materialized views? The basic idea of a materialized view is like, think of it like a regular view, right? Like think, a view is almost like a macro of, of, of a query. So instead of having to, I mean, like in case of post right, a view would say, like, you know, it's just a select query, create a view for it. Now, any time that someone does a, and you treat it like a, like a virtual table, and any time you do a select on it, the database system is basically replacing the, the, the name of the table with a, the nested query that's defined in your view. But in that, in that world, in regular views, every single time you run the query, you're recomputing whatever the, 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 the select query that the view points to. A materialized view basically says, generate the, the result, you know, when, when you declare the view, and then anytime anybody wants to query that, that view, you don't have to recompute it. You have the result already. But then the thing you can do is you can find, you can find materialized views on uh, maybe that they don't exact, exactly match what the query wants. 
like give me all the orders for this month. But then, I, it, and then you define that as a materialized view. Anytime anybody inserts a new order for this month, you have to then refresh that materialized view. And the data system will do this automatically if they support automatic refresh. In Postgres, you have to manually refresh it. In, in SQL Server and other systems, it'll do it for you automatically. It right? sounds like an index and that you have a separate storage of things. But its question is, yeah, sta yeah, statement, it sounds like an index. Yes, it's like a supplemental data structure. Yeah, that, 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 that's a subset of the data you're looking for. But the way the data system maintains it, as it, it's just like a temp table. But that if you, if you restart, it, it you know, comes back. Yeah. But the hard part is doing that incremental update. So if I insert one tuple, like say my, my view is like a, you know, the running total of the number of sales for this month. Well, if I insert a new order, I want to update that total. But I, don't have, I know, I, you know if, if I'm dumb, I'll just run the whole aggregation query from beginning to end. But if I'm clever about it, I can recognize, oh, well, I'm, this is just a sum of the total order amount. I know what this order amount is. Just increment it. Again, but not every system can do that. OK, again, so this class, we're talking about these two things. And then how we do data encoding will, will influence how we can do data parallelization and vectorization uh, later on. And then we'll cover vectorization uh, in more detail uh, when we talk about query processing uh, further along. But it's hard to, like, I try to avoid talking about SIMD in this lecture and vectorization in this lecture. Next lecture, you'll read the Fast Lanes paper, and it's, it's all about it. But we'll see how to do this, for, you know, do, use vectorization for other things like joins and sorting and other stuff uh, late, later in two weeks. All right, so today we just want to talk about storage models and then persistent data formats. Uh, I'm not going to talk about intermediate data formats. We'll cover that. We'll talk a little bit about Arrow today, but we'll, we'll cover that in more detail uh, when we talk about query processing. Right, it's really about these are the files that are on disk, whether it's an object store or a local file system, it doesn't matter. Right? Th th these are the actual bits that are getting put out in uh, persistent storage. Okay? All right, so the first thing we've got to discuss is what storage model we're going to use for these data files. And again, this, this will be some of, somewhat of a um, you know, repeat what we, we talked about in the intro class, but it's important to go over this again more detail to understand again what PAX is going to do for us later on when we start constructing the, the, the file formats. So the storage model is going to define how we're physically going to store the tuples uh, both on disk and in memory. Um, and again, this is not the actual bytes we're actually storing. It just says, like, OK, here's some tuple. Here's some attributes for them. I don't really care what those bytes are in those attributes, but where, how should I organize them in relation to both the attributes within the same tuple and then across other tuples? So the default storage model in most systems, or most people think about when they think about a data system, is going to be the NRA storage model or the row store. Uh, again, this is what BusTub is. This is what Postgres, MySQL, SQLite, Oracle. This is what most people get. Decomposition store model is the, the sort of pure column store. And then the PAX model will be a hybrid of the two of these. And, we're gonna, and you'll see that we'll want to use PAX because we'll have better locality for, uh, for attributes within the same tuple. Like they'll at least be in, in the same block. All right, again, so the, the, the easiest, or not easiest, but the, the default storage model that every system uh, can think, most people, when they think about data system, they think about the storage model is going to be the NRA or the row store. And again, the idea here is that we're going to store almost all the attributes for a single tuple contiguously in our pages or on, on our, our file or in memory, uh, one after another. And I'm saying almost because, again, there are sometimes, uh, in some systems, if you have oversized attributes, like something more than like you know four kilobytes that doesn't fit in a single page, they'll have an auxiliary storage. P Postgres calls this toast storage. Uh, I think some systems call it secondary storage. It's basically you just have a pointer to some other blob store thing that has uh, the large attributes. But we don't really care about that. And again, this is gonna be ideal for OTP workloads because in that environment, these applications, the transactions of the queries are mostly gonna be concerned about getting single single tuples. Like go get Andy's order order record. Um, and because we're going to want to, you know, up, you know, we're ingesting new information from the outside world, we're going to do inserts, up, and deletes. It's really easy for us to take any new tuple that someone inserted, go find a free slot in some page, and just write it all out there contiguously, right? And then when we want to commit the transaction, or we later need to flush the dirty page, assuming one tuple fits in a single page, it's one disk write to put that out there. So the, the page size in this world is typically going to be some constant uh, factor of four kilobytes. Right. Postgres by default is eight kilobytes. Oracle is four kilobytes, although I think you can tune that. DB2, you can tune this. MySQL is the biggest one, maybe at, at 16 kilobytes. There might be one that's 32 kilobytes too. I forget which one. But it's always going to be some, some it's going to be measured in kilobytes. 
like single digits kilobytes in this world. Because again, if you think about the work that they're trying to support, go get Andy's order record, my record isn't going to be that big. It isn't going to be megabytes. So it doesn't make sense for me to have these really big pages to store this row data because I got to go get that entire page and bring it in. I can't, you know, in, in the NSM world, I can't bring in partial pages. I got to bring the whole thing because I need the header, I need whatever else the data is in there because I need to protect it in the context of transactions. All right, so we're always, the page sizes are always going to be much, much smaller than we'll see in, uh, for OLAP workloads. And then because, it, again, because we're trying to do single tuple processing for the most part, we'll want to use the iterator, the volcano processing model uh, in this world. Again, I don't, I don't want to talk about too much about query processing, but that'll come later. And obviously, this sucks for OLAP, as I said, because in OLAP, we're doing large, large sequential scans uh, on a subset of the columns for the most part. So if I have 100 columns in my table, but I don't, my query only needs four of them, well, I got to bring in the other 96 columns that I don't need because it's all packed into the single page. So this is where the, the, the column store, the DSM, the decomposition storage model stuff uh, came along, where people recognize that, oh, for this different class of workloads, for OLAP workloads, it doesn't make sense to store everything contiguously. Instead, you want to break up the, the tuple based on its attributes. And then now you can store all the, the data for that attribute across multiple tuples contiguously. Um, and that's going to open up a bunch of advantages for compression and other things that, that we can take advantage of. And this, we, want only, we can do this uh, because, we're, again, we're mostly going to be running read-only queries. So we're not worried about how to do incremental inserts into our database. If someone wants to insert new data, you know, again, some systems will handle that, but oftentimes it'll be like a bulk load of like, here's a bunch of results, a bunch of data we've gotten, and then you don't have to worry about in incremental updates, right? Because again, in, if you had to do a transaction, like update this one record that had 100, tuple, sorry, 100 attributes, if I'm doing the decomposition storage model, I got to update 100 pages at least and write them all out transactionally. And that's going to be slow. That's going to be terrible. So we don't, we don't have to worry about that. These file sizes are going to be typically larger, uh, hundreds of megabytes. Now within this file, we'll break it up. We, this is the row group stuff that you read in the paper. Uh, you'll break it up into smaller chunks and then identify which, which of the pieces of the file I actually need. But the overall file itself is going to be, uh, could, could be quite large. So just to give an example of what this looks like, uh, say we have a really simple table, three attributes, and uh, uh, six, six rows, or six tuples. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to store all of the, uh, the, the values for a given column all within a single file. There'll be some metadata header at the front that maybe tell us additional information like what version of the data system wrote this data, uh, any additional statistics, like the zone map stuff that we want to store for that. There'll be a null bitmap to keep track of uh, you know, which of these attributes are actually null because we need a way to represent that. But again, we'll just store a separate file for each, each of the three attributes. Now, we'll see why we need to, do this in, need to do this in a second, but we're going to make sure that all the data we're storing has to be fixed length, right? I'm going to, I'm going to take a guess why, or knows why from last semester. So you compute the offset. So you compute the offset. So that, going back to the stitching thing, if I need to get for, the, for row zero, or tuple zero, I need to get its data, and I'm processing, you know, I'm, I'm at this position here, I know how to do simple arithmetic to jump down to, to, to the other column files Right? I know the length of the data that I'm storing uh, of each value, and I know what offset I'm at, so I just do the simple math and jump to the right offset. But of course, how we handle that for variable length data, like strings, which are super common, we'll see that in a second. So fixed length offsets isn't the only way to do this. It's the most common one. This is what pretty much almost everyone does, especially if you have a sort of pure uh, OLAP system or an OLAP system that was designed from, from the ground up to, be, to run these analytical workloads as a column store. The alternative is to embed tuple IDs. Uh, so for every single value in, you know, in a column, you have a little prefix that says, I'm, you know, I'm tuple 0, tuple 1, tuple 3, tuple 4. And now if you ever want to find the corresponding data or attributes for that same tuple across all the columns, you need an auxiliary data structure like a hash table that says, OK, for this column, for this tuple ID, here's the offset you want to jump to. Or at least, very least, like, here's the range or you should start at looking for it. Uh, yes. So does that mean that it's static for it to be an ability to like you know, square the length? I see. It's quite, the statement is the question is if if I'm saying everything has to be fixed length, but then you have strings, does that mean you can't do this? No. We'll, we'll see how to handle that in a second. The answer is going to be dictionary coding, because we want to convert anything that's variable length to fixed length. 
right? I'm busy with, when I'm, that was the next one I was gonna make is what I'm highlighting here. So, um, like I said, I'm only bringing this up, the bottom one, I'm like, I'm saying don't do this. I only bring it up because there are some systems do it, and as far as I know, it's only be done in cases where it was like a row store system, and then they added like a little specialized storage manager or storage engine to say, oh yeah, we also have a column store piece, and they need to be able to sort of handle the, or need to reuse some of the existing components that they had uh, to, to you know, do a process on column store data, so they add this, this, this these, you know, these tuple IDs. But this is what you want to do, you want to use the fixed length, right? And, and Parquet and Orc, they're all going to be fixed length. All right, again, so basically what he asked me was, how do I handle variable length data? The answer is going to be dictionary. Yes, question. Right, uh, the previous, previous length. So do you, do you use the like, running length the running? Do you still have the advantage of the fixed length? So his question is, or statement is, if I'm doing run length encoding, do I still have the advantage of uh, fixed length? Yeah. yeah, why wouldn't you? Yeah, so, so, yeah, so, so we won't talk about how to process front line encoding today, but the basic idea is that you do have to, like, you scan through to know where to jump. Like, okay, I, I'm looking for this value. I scan through, uh, and I know that if I'm looking for a, a two point, this offset, I keep scanning until I find the, the, RL, the run length encoding uh, entry that covers my offset. Yeah, but you need to scan through all the files. Right. So the same is you need to scan through all the, all the file. Again, we'll, we'll break this in pure DSM. Yes, you would have that problem. Like worst case, the worst case scenario, you, you have to scan to the very bottom because the thing you look for is at the very bottom, right? Uh, this is why another reason why we're going to use packs because it's basically going to break things up to, 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 to the row groups so that, so that in worst case scenario, yes, we have to scan the entire column if it's RLE and compressed, but like it's only going to be, you know, what, 10 megs or something like that. It's not that big. Right, again, so it'll be, what do you use dictionary encoding? Uh, and that allows convert variable length data into fixed length fi files. And if you, if you read the paper, if you pick this up, Parquet is very aggressive actually on their dictionary encoding. And their dictionary encode everything, even if it's already fixed length. Right? Orc only does this for, for, for strings, for variable length things. But then it turns out Parquet does pretty good still, because there's still, you can convert uh, dictionary encoding, we'll see in a second. You're, it's going to allow you to convert. Uh, data that, that may be in a, in a really large domain down to a much smaller domain, and then you can apply additional compression techniques on top of that, and you still get a win. Right? It seems counterintuitive that I, I would want to compress floats as dictionary codes, but we, we found that it actually works. This doesn't solve the problem of how to handle semi-structured data uh, in this world. The, word, the dumbest thing to do would be just treat semi-structured data as, as a text field, all right? and there's have the, the query engine do parse the JSON or whatever it is as it goes along, that's going to be super slow. Again, we'll see how to handle that in a second. Well, we, do, we can convert everything to columns. Right? And, then, and if there's string, string fields in, in the values of the, the nested data, the JSON values, again, we'll just dictionary code that too. Just treat it like a regular column. OK, so as I said, the, uh, most OLAP queries are never going to access a single column in a table by itself. Right? It's very rare to say, like, select, you know, select some, you know, average in some single column without any where clause, without any group by, without any sorting or anything like that. Right? So single, uh, I'm not saying that single column, uh, single column queries don't exist. I'm saying they're, they're, they're not that common, or they're not as common as, as multi-column queries. So if we do the decomposition storage model where we're storing single, uh, you know, single files per column, then I'm going to have to jump through different files if I need to start putting things back together in order to process my query. Like my where calls might reference four columns. I got to go jump to those four files at different offsets and go get the data that I need. So we want a way to get all the benefits that we get from having columnar data, either through, you know, uh, through getting better compression or also doing vectorized execution. We, want all, we still want all that, but we don't want the downsides of, uh, of of having separate files. So this, this is where PAX is going to solve, this PAX is going to solve for us. Um, so this was invented, uh, actually I think here, so this is the paper is from Natasha Alamaki. She was the database professor before I was, like she left, like she, before I showed up, she was teaching 721 in 2006. Uh, and then she left to go to EPFL. 
um, and, and I revised 721 when I showed up. But there's a paper she wrote in 2002 that basically recognized that, that you know, there is this problem if you have a lot of memory, uh, then you don't want to pay this penalty of, sorry, it, it, not that you have a lot of memory, you don't want to pay this penalty of having to jump between these different columnar files to put things back together. Uh, if you have enough memory to, to bring in uh, a big chunk of data, you can th still keep things in a columnar format, um, but then now the data uh, for a, that's related to a single tuple will be close to, to each other. Right? So again, we get all the benefit of columnar storage, but still maintain the spatial locality of the row store. Right? So the way this is going to work is that uh, we have our example table before. So we're going to horizontally partition the, our, our table into row groups. And the size of the row group will, will vary per implementation. Right? For now, let's just assume that we, we, it's some you know, fix, fixed number of tuples, like three tuples. Then now within that row group, we're going to have a header, of course, that's going to tell us information about what's in this row group. Uh, but then now we're going we're to lay out the data for a single column or single attribute sequentially or contiguously. And then when, when, once we're done for all the tuples that, in that column, then we jump to the next one. So we're going to call this piece here within the row group, we're going to call this a column chunk. I think the, the ORC paper calls them, or the ORC system calls them stripes. Uh, row groups and ch column chunks are uh, what, what's in Parquet. We'll just use that. Right? And then once we lay everything out for the, for the first row group, then we do the same thing for the other. And then in the footer, we're going to have metadata that keep, that's going to tell us what's in this file. Yes? So what's the reason that we have multiple row groups instead of just having different, like multiple files? This question, what's the reason for having different row groups uh, versus just having a row group be a single file? Yeah, so you could have a, right, so you could have, you could define your, like, Parquet or Org. You could say, I want my file to only have one row group, right? But then now you, you basically have a bunch of metadata that's, that's very narrow just for that one row group. So the idea here is that if I put a bunch of row groups, the right amount, again, it's probably it's an NP-complete problem, right? it's difficult to know, the right number of row groups to have the right, to have the right granularity for the scope of the zone maps and other metadata you're maintaining, it's hard to know. I guess my, my question is, like, what's the benefit of having like, these multiple? Uh, Within a single file? In a single file, versus just having like, just multiple files. So I could have a zone map in, in the footer, the metadata, that tells me within my row groups, here's the data that I have, right? Or I could have it for like, you know, I have, you know, for a single, for some column, say the date. Here's, here's the min and the max value for all the, column, uh, all the values in that single column right, across all the row groups. So, so why can't you have that, like, un, like that, that bottom metadata inside? Like, right, now what I'm saying is, so now, like, if I want to go, if I, I'm looking for all the orders from this month, and my, my files are, have been sort of sequentially based on time, now I just go read this, and I can figure out, oh, this, this thing contains all the orders from 2023. I don't need anything in there. I'm looking for, you know, January 2024. So I can skip it entirely. If I do what you're proposing, then I have to go read this header from every single, uh, you know, from multiple files. So it's just another level of granularity. It's another level of granularity. But again, what I'm saying is, like, the, like what's the right size? It depends. Which is a cop-out answer in databases, but it can answer for a lot of things. It depends on the query. It depends on the data. It depends on what you're trying to do. So uh, is the row group, one single row group, going to be one photo kilobyte page? Or is it yeah, it, yeah, so his question is, is, is a row group one, one photo kilobyte page? No. It's going to be tens of megabytes. Again, it's the same thing he brought up. It's, it's the granularity of this, right? I, if, I, if I'm storing just four kilobytes of data, but I have to have this metadata thing in, then like, say the metadata is, I don't know, half a kilobyte, or sorry, a kilobyte. Then I can only have three kilobytes of data you know, in, in a row group. And I, now I am basically have a bunch of overhead of just metadata that I don't actually need. Yes? Then would like, there be at least a minimum of like, you want each like, like stripe to be like at least one page so you pull in that column? And like get that benefit of like not like pulling in data that you don't need if you're just doing like a subset of columns that you're querying over. So your question is like, shouldn't the, the the size of the column group or the size of the row group be a certain size or what? Like a single stripe, like a single column chunk, should be like a, at least a page. Yeah. At least a page, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So will the zone map be in the footer of the entire file and in the metadata of each row group as well? We'll, we'll cover about the zone maps in a second, but. There will be a zone map per row group in this metadata thing. And then optionally, you can have a zone map that covers the, the columns in, in, the, in the metadata. And this is actually one of the problems of, of Parquet and Orc is that like, they added this later. A bunch of implementations don't actually support it. 
So like it's uh, like it's it, it, in the specs as it's there, but it may not actually not, not actually be there. Yes. Uh, our question is, are row groups random? What do you mean like random? Like, are, are they just the boundaries, you mean? Yeah. Uh, we'll cover that in a second. Like, the, there's a sizing protocol that, the, that they have. Or that for these different formats, they'll say, like, I want my row group to be at least this size or this number of tuples. And there's trade-offs for, for them, for those choices. Yes? Are these attributes the same length across different chunks? This question is, are these attributes the same length across different chunks? Yes. Uh, let me think about that. I think you can actually have different, uh, within a row group, I think you can vary the encoding scheme you're using. So I think they, they could be different. But since I have my metadata, what encoding scheme I'm using, if I say I want tuple at offset six, like logical offset six, and I jump to, the, to, this, uh, to this row group, I know it's in here. I use the metadata to then figure out, okay, the size of the attributes is, is, for this column is, 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 is this. Therefore, I can do my math to go find that. So it could be different per, per row group and certainly different per file. But again, I just do the same arithmetic that I did before. But in the column group, they all, they all be the same size, or the, co the column chunk. OK. Uh, and I would say, it's, it's sort of his question here is there'll, there'll be the, there's a global metadata that can tell me like, what's in, in my file, how things are encoded. Um, the, you would think, and it's essentially the header, right? Remember the slot of pages stuff from, from last semester? That was literally in the header, the, the beginning bytes of a page. They're putting this at the bottom. I'm going to take a guess why. He says the size is not fixed. Uh, the size of what? He says the size of the metadata is not, is not fixed. No. Again, these files are big. And I don't know what the metadata is going to be, like what's the min-max value for all the data that I have until I process all the data, right? And then also the reason why they're putting it at the end and not the beginning, because this comes from the Hadoop world or HDFS world from 10 years ago, uh, which is a pen-only file system. I mean, I can't make uh, in-place updates to the file without rewriting it. So if I have my, if I'm bulk loading a bunch of data to generate a Parquet and Orc file, I got to scan through all the data and I'm writing out these row groups incrementally. Uh, and then when I'm done, all right, let me close the file. The, the metadata, you, know, you can't go back and put it back up here because you've already written out the beginning of the file. S3 is the same thing, right? It, it's, 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 you can't do in-place updates. You have to basically overwrite something entirely. And that would be expensive because then you basically, if I wrote out a one gigabyte parquet file, I don't want to have to go write it back out again just to update you know, the metadata. So they always put it at the bottom. Uh, the, the zone map stuff actually in the bottom that's for Parquet here, again, I think the paper talks, talks about that was added oh, 2018, 2019. That was actually my student at Cloudera that added that. She took this class. Uh, and now she's a PhD student at, um, at University of Maryland. So that, you know, there's some connection there with 721. Okay. So, up until, again, 10 years ago, sorry, yes? Um, so since the metadata is at the end of the file, um, how do you, like if you're just flipping through the metadata of all two pages and trying to figure out what do you need to read, you just go to the end of the file and bring the last couple of pages in to get this metadata? Yeah, the question is like, if it's at the end, uh, how do I start processing the file? Yeah, so the entry point for the file is the footer. So I think the way it works is that the last 32 bits of the file is the length of, of the footer. You gotta re so you read that, and that'll tell you, you know, how much back you get read to get the complete view of the of the metadata. Yes. You're saying this these are, this kind of file is basically similar to a log structure merge tree, or? Uh, it's a question. Am I saying this is like a log structure merge tree? No. Why would I say that? Um, well, you mentioned the context of Hadoop and the pen only SRP. Uh, so pen only means like like in Hadoop, like the file system only allows for like like open a file and there's append bytes to it. So like that, but like Hadoop doesn't know what you're storing, it just sees bytes, right? The, this would not be, an, like this is not LSM, this is literally like, there's one version of a, of a, of a piece of data, a tuple, and I'm just writing it out sequentially as I go. But I'm gonna organize it in this PAX format. 
OK, so prior to 10 years ago, uh, even the early column store systems, like the Verticos, the Green Plums, and so forth, uh, they, were, they had their own proprietary data format. I think I mentioned this last class. Like most data systems you think about, SQLite, Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, and so forth, they, like the, the, when they put bits down on disk, the format is going to be proprietary to that database system. Right? The, like the system is designed to, to read and write that data. Now, there are some systems, like, like DuckDB is really good about this. They can read SQLite database files. They can read other database files. Right? But most systems don't do that. Right? And so the problem with this is that since all of these different data systems have their own proprietary data format, you can't share data across different disparate systems. Like I can't take a Postgres data directory files and plop it down and let MySQL read it. Again, DuckDB is trying to be a, like a Swiss Army knife kind of thing. We can ignore that. But that's how, not, not how most systems work. So that means the only way I could get data out of one system and put it into another system is to write a SQL query to dump it out uh, and then convert it to, to a CSV, TSV, or JSON, XML file, some other format, and then, then do bulk insertion on the, for the other data system to then convert it into the, you know, their own proprietary format. But again, with, with the Hadoop and the cloud stuff taking off in the early 2010s, you had now, as I showed in the last class, you had all these operational databases that want to start writing data out so that you could read it into your data warehouse. But again, you don't want to have to do this conversion. I just wanted to put things out to my object store and not worry about having to do the, uh, additional conversions. So this is where the, the Parquet and Orc stuff comes, comes into play because they were, that's the problem they were trying to solve. They're trying to be a universal file format that, that you know, one application or some, some other thing upstream in your application stack could, could generate and then you wouldn't have to do that conversion to be able to read it. And you would get all the benefits of a binary encoding scheme that you would want in like a column store or a PAX lay layout without having to, to revert it to a text format like this. Like CSV is the worst thing you can do because now basically all your binary data gets converted into ASCII characters. And, and you got to parse that and deal with that when, when you load it back in. Same thing with JSON. So the idea is that th th you would define a spec of what, here's what the file format is. And then whoever, whatever system wants to be able to read it could either use an off-the-shelf implementation of it, which have, have, they have questionable quality, uh, or write their own, which again, of questionable quality. Right? So the, this is not entirely a new idea. Like it actually goes back to the 1990s. Um, in the high-performance high computing world of the scientific community, uh, there was this thing called HDF5. That means there was 4, 3, 2, 1. There was previous versions to this, but 5 is the current one everyone still uses. But this was a binary format to store compressed uh, multidimensional arrays. And that you could have your, you know, whatever random Fortran program you had to do processing on you know, the data from scientific instruments or satellite data. You, know, you, you could use this universal file format and use it for different experiments. But this is almost entirely ignored by the database community. Right? So 2009, people recognized that, oh, Hadoop wants to generate a bunch of these files that we want to be able to use for, for different purposes. And so the original version of the data format in uh, Hadoop was this thing called sequential sequence files. is literally key value pairs, right? Like serialized uh, value strings that only the, the, the function of the Hadoop code knew how to process, like your application code. Um, so there was no embedded schema information. So they replaced this with this thing called Avro. Um, and I think this came out of maybe Cloudera or the Hadoop project. Um, but if this was still row oriented. So you know, even though the column store systems, systems existed at the time, Hadoop was still writing things out and processing data as rows, which sucked. So then in, uh, there was an, another version before Parquet called RC file, uh, actually before ORC from, from Meta. Um, but then at the same time in 2013, uh, Cloudera and Twitter for, working on Impala, they put out Parquet, and then Meta put out uh, ORC for, uh, for Apache Hive. Hive is basically a SQL engine, a SQL query engine on top of Hadoop or MapReduce. So it converts your SQL queries to MapReduce jobs. It's still around today, but you don't want to use it. Um, so again, Parquet and Orca is, is the dominant ones, but at this point, they're over 10 years old. And they're still widely used today. Uh, Carbon Data is an extension of Parquet from Huawei. Uh, it, it adds additional metadata for keeping track of the schema versions and so forth. Um, I don't know anybody who uses this other than Huawei. The open source version that we tried it doesn't work. It doesn't compile. Um, but somebody's still working on it. And then Arrow, again, I mentioned this before, this is going to be an in-memory, think of this as like almost in-memory version of Parquet. Uh, and it's going to allow me to do exchange data between different processes you know, over the network or in-memory in on, on the same box. 
Um, and this came out of Dremio and the, from the Panos guy. So again, for this class, we're only going to focus on, on, on these two. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other ones that I think mentioned in the paper. There's an extension or a newer version of Orc called Dwarf from uh, Facebook. And then there's this thing called Alpha that we've been talking with them about, the, the, so the next generation one. We can ignore all that. We want to focus on you know, Parquet and Orc because that's, that's, what, that's what pretty much everyone, everyone's using today. And it's not to say that these formats are the best and this is what every system should be using. It's just what, it's what's commonly being used. Like, is SQL the best query language? No, there's, it has problems. But is it widely used and therefore it's not going away? Yes, so same thing, right? Parquet and Oracle are widely used, so we have to be able to handle them. Like on Hugging Face, you can get native data directly out of, in a Parquet format, directly. All right, so the things we're gonna talk about is when we design our, our, our file format is what metadata we wanna maintain, uh, the, the layout of the data, um, what type system we're gonna, we're gonna support, the encoding schemes or, or sort of the compression schemes we would use for the actual the data itself. Uh, and then block compression is sort of the, after I've done the encoding, can I run like gzip or something on it to, to, to compress it? We'll talk a about filters and then we'll finish off talking about the nested data. So the paper I had you guys read, again, this is something that I wrote with uh, my former student, PhD student here, who's at Xinhua, and his PhD student, um, and then the guy that embedded Python and Pandas, um, who was at Voltron, um, and he and I have been to talking about, hey, Parquet is kind of has some problems because he worked on uh, the, the inventor of Arrow. He worked on some Parquet stuff too and realized that we, you know, we wanted to investigate why, you know, what are the problems in a modern environment for these, these two, the most popular storage formats. At the same time, unbeknownst to us, Microsoft was actually doing the same evaluation, the same experiment, experiments that we were. Uh, their paper came out, I think, uh, in October and ours came out like in November. So like, we dodged a bullet. Uh, there's a, you know, they approach the problem differently um, and did different kind of evaluation. So they're complementary. I'll talk a little bit about them, but the, the, main, the main takeaway I got from them is their findings uh, corroborate what we found in ours. So let's, I felt good as a scientist that it worked out. All right, so the first thing is when, again, the, the metadata, what metadata do we want to put in the, in the, in the file? And so I already mentioned the zone map stuff. Um, and, uh, but the basic idea is for Parquet and Orc, these are meant to be self-describing or self-contained uh, file formats, meaning everything I need to know to, uh, to interpret what the bytes mean in my file or be contained in the file itself, right? And this is opposed to like thinking like in a, a system like BusTub or, or Postgres or MySQL, you have a bunch of files to keep track of like the catalog, like there's blocks in the catalog that keeps the track of the schema, of the tables, what the types are and so forth. And then you have pages for the actual data. So in order for me to understand what's in my data pages, I gotta go read the, the pages for the catalog. Oracle is the only system that actually packs everything within the page itself for like disaster recovery. So that way, if your Oracle database gets destroyed, your disk gets destroyed, and you can recover some pages, you can still un interpret those bytes because everything you need to know what are in those bytes, what those bytes mean are actually in the page itself. But then there's other limitations in Oracle. Like you can only have a thousand columns in Oracle, right? For other, not just because they want to be self-contained. There's other, there's other reasons why they have that problem. But the, again, the bottom line is everything we need to know what's in the, in, the, in the file is in the file itself. We don't need to go read some external catalog or external, external data. And so we'll keep track of the table schema. And the way they're going to do this in, uh, is to basically serialize, here's my, you know, here's my columns. They're, they're of this type and this size and so forth. Any additional annotations about them. Uh, and then within the row groups, I have to keep track of like how it's being encoded. So that when I read the file, I know how to then process those bytes and put it back to its original form. Does anybody here use Thrift or Protobuf? One, a few. But Protobuf is from Google. Uh, Thrift is from Meta, sorry. Uh, basically, again, you define like a schema, almost like, like a create table statement. You, you define like, here's my, uh, you know, here's my columns, here's their types and so forth, their names. And then they have a way to then generate uh, a, a binary encoding for what that, what, what that schema actually is. And so they basically just piggyback off of this, serialize the bytes, and then embed that in, in the file and then metadata. The big problem is going to be, though, I, if I have a really wide table and say I only want to learn about you know, two or three columns out of, of a thousand columns, I, can't, I have to deserialize the entire you know, uh, protobuf or the, the thrift message to, to, to convert that. Um, so that's going to be a big problem uh, for these file formats as well. There's newer versions of like, there's better versions like flat buff, uh, flat buffers from Google. There's other, there's better versions of these things 
but at the, at the time, this is what this is what existed, and the file formats carry carry over that legacy. The row group offsets and length. We talked about this again. This is going to give us a directory that tells where to, how to jump in the file to find the beginning of each row group, and then there'll be some basic metadata like the number of tuples that I have in each row group, or what the zone maps are potentially, right? And I can use this information to, to determine whether I need to even, even read the rest of the file. All right, so the format stuff we've, we've mostly already talked about. We're going to use packs for this, and then we're going to split it up based on uh, into row groups, and then that'll contain one or more column chunks. And the question has come up is like, how, what size of the row group should we, should we use? And in the case of Parquet, they're going to use uh, just on the number of tuples that you, actually, that you have. And you, you, can, you can change this. You can specify as you're creating the file, like I want, I want my row group to be a million tuples or 10 million tuples or so forth, right? But it's always based on the number of, number of tuples. Orc takes, takes a different approach, and they specify it based on the, the size of the data. So the default, I think, is 250 megs. So what are some pros and cons for both of these? We already talked a little bit about this. Yes? Yeah, so he said, if the tuples are massive, or like, if I have a lot of attributes, right, ignore like storing blobs. If I had to say I have 10,000 columns, yeah. then a million tuples times 10,000 columns is going to be a pretty big row group. So what happens in that case? Why is that bad? Well, you can sit on storage. At no point, sorry, his statement, his statement is, uh, his statement is, uh, uh, will it even fit in your storage? At no point this semester should we ever say, are we going to run out of disk, right? <laughs> I mean, S3, for our purposes, is infinite. Like, long as your credit card keeps, you know, is, is, as long as Amazon keeps charging your credit card, you're, not, you're never going to run out of storage, right? And then if you're at the point where, like, they start running out of storage, they will call you and be like, hey, who are you? What are you doing, right? <laughs> storage is infinite for us. Yes? Could it be the data split across multiple pages? They said it could be. be they could be split across multiple pages. That's assumed, right? Like page size is four kilobytes in hardware, but that's assumed. Your zone maps become less helpful. He says your zone maps become less helpful. Yes, that's one. Yes, that like again, the granularity, the scope of the zone map is so large that like anything, like anything I look in there, be, be like, oh yeah, your your value range for this number is zero to an infinity. Great, like that's useless. I'm missing a key thing. One more. I have to bring in the entire row group. Right? So if I have a massive row group, then I'm just going to have this huge thing of memory that I've got to bring in in order to start, start processing and understand what's going on. Right? The benefit, though, is that I can size this in such a way that I'm guaranteed to, or at least I can maximize my chances to do vectorized processing. That like, I'm always going to have enough data to put in my SIMD lanes uh, or scan across, have multiple threads process uh, and, and paralyze it. Yes? The statement is, if you're pulling from S3, would you be pulling the entire Parquet file? No. So like, again, in S3, you can do byte offsets and lengths. So I jump, get to the header, sorry, get the footer, get the metadata, I know what row groups I have, and then if I, my zone maps are selective enough, I can then say, oh, I don't need this row group and this row group, let me just go get the byte ranges that I, that I need. Question: when, when would you not have enough data to put in your SIMD? Um, so again, say if I have a really wide tuple uh, with a lot, of, a lot of attributes, then I might only have, this is an extreme example, I might only have four tuples in, in my row group because it's just so huge. Now, maybe the SIMD lane is maybe too fine a granularity, but just think if I'm processing those multiple threads. Right? Don't think, again, think. Again, it's, I, I'm jumping ahead to what we were talking about in the semester, but like, don't think in the bus tub world where like one thread is running this one operator, go gets one page from memory, and then does whatever wants on it. Think of like I'm going to have some other uh, piece of the system, the I/O scheduler or whatever you want to call it. The it's going to say I need this file. You go get the blocks in, and then maybe some coordinator figures out, okay, yeah, we do want to process this, and oh yeah, it is. It's a half half a gig, so this thread processes the first half, this other thread processes the second half. So I want to have enough. Work for everyone to do. Yes. The decision on like whether to use like number of tuples or specific storage size seems like is efficiency is predicated on the like the size of the tuples. Yes. Is like can the people like listen to like implementing like hybrid systems where like you choose which one you use based off of like what data you're putting in your like specific file? So this question is, is it like again the cop out answer on databases it depends. 
So clearly it depends on, sometimes this is good, sometimes this is good. Has anybody tried to do a hybrid solution where you support both? Well, that's gonna be another theme we'll see as we go along, although we're short in time. Uh, the increasing the complexity of the file format uh, means that when you're actually processing tuples, then you have to like, you have branch based predictions because now you have different code paths you need to consider. Plus there's the engineering complexity now to support both. So Parquet does this, Orc does that. We see there's other things too, like in, in, you know, bringing like for like a transactional system. Should you flush the log buffer when you've written so many transactions, or when the log file is a certain size, or when you've uh, when, when when you've you've run for a certain amount of time? The, yeah, the, there's pros and cons to all those different choices, but from the engineering perspective, it's just easier to pick one. Or should I use two phase you know two, two phase locking or OCC? Yeah, there's times you want one versus the other, but everyone just does one. It's so hard to build the whole system. Why add additional complexity? Yes. His question is why why is not having being able to put a row group entirely in memory a bad idea? So I, I gotta go fetch it from from somewhere. I bring it to the node that's gonna process it. I don't have enough memory for it. Where does it gotta go? Process like to disk. Technically, you can process part by part, right? You, why do you need to process the entire row group? His statement is like could you uh, could you break up the row group and, and incre execute it uh, incrementally? Yes. But then it's another request to get more data as I need. So this is just a diagram from, uh, from Databricks showing uh, sort of tutorial what Parquet looks like. And you can sort of see, again, all the things we talked about here. Here's the footer. There's these row groups uh, that are numbered. And then within them, you have the column chunks. And within the column chunk, you would have uh, additional pa page metadata for the encoded values and so forth. Right? The, the, the exact distinction of how we're going to lay out those internal parts versus Parquet and ORC, I, I, I don't care that much about. But again, the idea is that like, there's this hierarchical nature to the file and we can store additional metadata as, as we go along. And the right size of each, each, each part, again, depends on a bunch of different things. All right, so uh, we're at CMU, and they love type systems in the PL group. Uh, so we have to worry about that about a little bit. Um, so the type system is going to define in our file format. You're shaking your head yes. <laughs> the, 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 the type system is going to define what the, uh, you know, how we actually can store, store the types themselves and what, what are the bytes going to look like. So there's the physical type, and that's the lowest level representation you have for a given value. And for this, we're not going to do anything special. We're, for the most part, for, for integers and floating point numbers, we're going to use uh, the IEEE 754 standard. And that, that specifies what, how hardware should represent the data. You can think of like a, a declare an integer in 32 on, on C++, that's the 74 standard. That's what I get, because that's what the hardware gives me. We'll talk about strings uh, uh, in, a, in a few more lectures. Again, that, there's some tricks we can do to speed that up. And then the logical types will be built on top of the physical types. And it's basically going to define how we would map some logical type to a physical type. So for example, if I want to store timestamps, well, what is a timestamp? It's just the number of seconds or, or milliseconds or nanoseconds some, from some starting point. Well, that's just a number. So I could just store that as a, as a physical type, as a int 64. And then I have a notion of a logical type that says how to parse the bits within that, that, uh, that physical type. So Parquet and Orc have different complexity to their, their uh, type system, and then that determines how much work you have to do upstream is the, the thing actually generating data for these file formats or actually consuming it, how much work you have to do to have to interpret the contents. So in Parquet, they have the bare minimum of types. right? They only have N32, N64, N96, and then the, the 750 standard, and then the byte arrays, and then um, they don't even have strings, right? because you, you would interpret that as, as, a, as a byte array. right? So it's interesting, they don't store you know, in, eight bit ints or 16 bit ints, right? So if you declare I want an eight bit int or a 16 bit int, they're still gonna it, store it as a 32 bit, 32 bit int. And, and the reasoning is that, okay, well yeah, there's a bunch of zeros in my bits for, that I'm not using, well that'll just compress out, right? And that, that reduces the complexity of what they have to support. Oracle is much larger, uh, right? They have you know, all these various different types. Some of these are logical, some of these are physical, they don't really make a distinction, but you know, they, you, you can find you know way more things than you can with uh, than in Parquet. I'm not saying one is bad versus the other. Um, it's just how they how they chose to implement, implement things. All right. So now the encoding scheme is going to specify for, for a given physical or logical type. Yes. Why isn't ORC better? Because if you have more types, you can do different encoding for all of them. 
This question is, why isn't ORC better? Because if you have more types, you can do more things in coding them. So the part KB will say you, want, you just represent it as logical types. And you extend, you extend the, the file format that way. Um, I've never taken a type system class. So this is my understanding. Um, all right, so uh, again, the coding scheme is going to specify for the physical and logical types, the actual bits themselves. How, you know, how can we actually store them for contiguous or related tuples within our, our column chunk? Um, and the paper talks about a bunch of different schemes that we've covered in the intro class. Uh, I don't think I mentioned frame of reference in the intro class. It's basically like delta encoding, but instead of having, like in delta encoding, it's like what's the, 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 the difference between the value before you? Uh, it's you pick some like, starting point, um, like maybe the min value of a column chunk, and then now you're just storing the, the delta from that, that global value. Right? So it's, a, it's, it's sort of a variant of, 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 um, it's a variant of uh, delta encoding. And then there's partial frame of reference encoding, which I think the paper mentions P4. That's basically for the, any, if you have any outliers that would wreck your encoding scheme, they have a, a way to handle those separately. But we can ignore that. The one I want to spend time talking about is actually dictionary encoding because, one, this is the most common encoding scheme that most data systems support. Um, this is where you get most of the win for getting compression. Um, and it, you know, for, for these, the, the different schemes here vary not in how they implement it, but more like when it's triggered. Like in ORC, they're very aggressive using RLE. Like if they see three or more contiguous values, then, the, then RLE kicks in. Uh, if you're in Parquet, it has to be eight or more. And you can't change that. And so you don't know, talk about dictionary encoding because because you can then take the, the, the results of the dictionary encoding, the compressed column, and then apply all these other things on top of it and get, get it compressed even more. All right, dictionary encoding, again, this is the same thing with intro class. The basic idea is that we're going to replace uh, values that, that occur often in our column with some smaller fixed length dictionary code from a smaller domain. Um, and then we use that at runtime to figure out, OK, if I see this dictionary code in this column, I can do, reference the dictionary to figure out what the, what the actual value should be. And again, this is how we convert very length strings and very length data into to fixed length values that we, we can store in our, um, in, in our columns. It means the metadata is going to be now arbitrary length, because all of the strings that were, that were variable length in our column are now being stored in the dictionary, which is stored in the, in the header of the row group. So the code, dictionary codes could either be positions within the dictionary, and therefore you have to maintain a hash table to figure out how to find that position or, uh, in, in, the, in the dictionary. Or we could do uh, offsets within the dictionary, assuming it's like everything is contiguous bytes. All right. We can also optionally sort the values in the dictionary, and that'll help us get some additional benefits for doing compression in some cases. And then we can further compress the dictionary or encode in columns. To, to, to reduce them even further, again, using RLE and other techniques. So in the different formats, they, handle the you know, they have to handle the case when the dictionary becomes too large because there's too many unique values, and therefore I'm losing all the benefit of dictionary encoding. Like if I have my, my column is just monotonically increasing values from one to a billion, then it doesn't, it's kind of stupid to store dictionary code for a billion tuples that are all unique because I'm going to have a billion dictionary codes. So now I have the original column that's dictionary encoded with, with, with a billion unique values, and I'm storing the billion unique values in the dictionary, so I'm double the size of it. So they have various te the, the techniques to figure out, okay, this is not working out, I don't want to do dictionary encoding. So in the case of Parquet, if the dictionary gets larger than one megabyte, then they, they just stop, and then everything comes out, comes after that point, it's just stored as regular, uh, the plain encoding, the, the original values. In the case of ORC, they compute the number of distinct values ahead of time, but basically, they have a, a look-ahead buffer where they can say, let me look at the, when I'm starting to write out a chunk of data, let me go look ahead at like 512 values or 500 values, go figure out whether I, there's enough distinct values and I think the rest of the data is going to look like that and does it make sense to do dictionary coding or not. If they get it wrong, then they do the same thing as Parquet. They basically stop encoding um, and uh, just store data in, in its native format. So here's a really simple example. I have some column with a bunch of strings in it. Uh, if I'm doing an unsorted dictionary, then the, the values of the, of, the, of the strings that I'm trying to compress will just be in the order that they appear as I'm scanning through the column. Right? And I can either store the position in the, in the dictionary. Again, so the, the first one here was, was uh, uh, William. So at offset 1, uh, then, then I, or position 1, I would find the, the, the actual string that I wanted. Or I can store this as an offset. So if I take uh, 
treat this as bytes. So I know that I, if I look at my dictionary, I need to jump to the seventh byte, uh, and that's going to tell me where the starting point for my, for my entry will be. I, and I don't need to maintain a hash table. Yes? Any advantages or disadvantages either way? His question is, what are the advantages or disadvantages? Against the hash table. Hash table, right? So we'll see arrow later on. Arrow does it this way, because then you don't have to serialize the hash table. You pre, you, well, they're going to pre-sort everything, and then jump into it more easily. Bingo, yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, and you have a sorted dictionary. Again, you, 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 you get all the dictionary values ahead of time, and then, then you sort them. Uh, and then you, uh, then again, it's just like before, you have position in, into the dictionary or, or, or an offset, a byte offset, right? But you can kind of see now, like here in this example here, like I have Andy repeated a bunch of times. Well, one is now I've converted things to, to, to integers in my dictionary codes. But now I have repeated values. So then I can take this and say, oh, well, I have you know, four twos in a row. Let me compress that with RLE. Or I could do you know, delta encoding or partial, uh, sorry, frame of reference, where now I just say, OK, these are all integers. They're all in a small domain, because I only have four different unique values in my dictionary. And I can then compress these things. Yes? Oh, yeah. His question is okay. So if I if I recognize that I have a bunch of I'm have a bunch of random strings, and I can't do uh, I can't do dictionary encoding, but now I have a bunch of very long data. How do I handle that? You have auxiliary data, and, you, and then now you're just storing the offsets into that, that blob. Okay. So a couple of design decisions we have to make is what data we actually want to compress with dictionary encoding. I mean, we're running short on time. Sorry. Yeah, it's a lot we're going to get to. Sorry. Um, so as I said before, Parquet, they compress everything. Floats, integers, strings, dates, right? They have, again, a small number of primitive types. They compress all of that. Um, in Orc, they only compress strings. And this seems, right, this seems like common sense because uh, most of the variability you're going to see, is, or the, the, the randomness you will see in values are going to be mostly, or sorry, the repeated values will be in strings, not in uh, not in integers and floats, right? But when we did our analysis, it actually turns out to be the, the, the orc way, sorry, the parquet way is better. Next question is, um, what do you do? Can you compress the encoded data? So parquet is pretty simplistic. They will just do RLE and bit packing. Again, bit packing is just saying, oh, I recognize that uh, my dictionary codes are 30, 32-bit integers, but my values are within you know, 0 to 20. So I can use 8-bit integers for that, or even some smaller amount. And now my column gets compressed even further. And then if I have repeated values, I can do RLE on that. But again, they only kick, RLE only kicks in uh, if you have eight or more values. In ORC, they have a bunch of different things you could do, right? RLE, delta encoding, bit packing, uh, frame of reference. Um, and they basically have a greedy algorithm. They, they, again, they look ahead in the buffer uh, to try to figure out what the data looks like, run some heuristics to figure out which, which of these approaches is the best, right? Um, it always tries to use RLE first, and then if it can't, then it tries delta, and then if it can't do that, it uses either bit packing or frame of reference. And then another design decision is, is the dictionary that's being, that's being generated for these encoded values, do you expose that to be outside of the, the file format, or the library that's processing the file? Right? Let me take a guess why you'd want to do that. So if we go back here. So say I want to look up, find all the, uh, my query is, uh, my query is uh, uh, select count from, from, from the table where name equals Andy. So if I can then look at the dictionary, uh, I can, it's almost like a zoom out. I can see whether it's Andy is even there or not, right? Or you know, select, um, more simple. What's that? Range query might also be easier if you have a sorted dictionary. A range dictionary. So a range query might also be easier if you have a sorted dictionary. Um, yeah, if you want to count all, the, count all the unique values within a given range, I could do that by just looking at the dictionary. Right? That's another example. So uh, Parquet and Orc do not do this. 
So in the library implementations, when you say scan some column, you basically get an iterator through the, their library, and that's going to give you back the, the columns that you asked for in their original form. So underneath the covers, the library is doing all the decoding and compressing for you. Right? So again, that means that the, you can't really push down predicates all the way down to the lowest level of looking at the file itself. You do have to do whatever, whatever the, the library spits out back to you. So this has been recognized as a problem. Uh, so there's a paper we're not going to cover from uh, Google uh, called, for a system called Priscilla. Um, this was developed at, in house at, at, uh, for YouTube to process, do analytics, but also serving, uh, serving data on uh, online manner, which we don't want to care about right now. But there's this little blurb here. For, they developed their own file system, or so file format, instead of using Orca Parquet called Artis. And one of the advantages they talk about in Artis is that, oh, they actually expose the dictionary to the, the query engine so that you can do the, the predicate pushdown that you want to do. Right? So this is, this is something, as I mentioned before, this is a known problem in Parquet and Orc, and then the newer stuff that people are looking at uh, uh, once, once I solve, solve this problem is exposed to you what the dictionary is. Because then now you can do, you know, you can do evaluation on directly in compressed data uh, by compressing your predicate and then comparing your predicate versus the, the compressed data rather than decompressing everything first. All right, next thing is to do block compression. And this is basically taking off the shelf naive general purpose compression algorithm uh, that just take the blocks, the row groups, and just run that and compress it. All right? And the, the paper talks about well, Parquet and Orc, I think the default is snappy. Uh, the modern, the, the best compression algorithm you want to use right now is actually Z standard from Facebook. There's a newer version that's not out yet. Uh, it's called something different um, that supposedly is better. But Parquet and Orc, again, they come with, with, with snappy because you know, that was the thing back in the day right? when, when, when those file formats are invented. So there's this, you know, the things you have to consider whether you actually want to do this or not is whether you, you know, you're willing to pay the, the, the computational overhead of compress, or sorry, decompressing the data, the blocks when it comes back, even though it's already been encoded with one you know, dictionary encoding other schemes. Like you can still get some, some compression benefits, um, but now it's going to make processing the data much slower because you have to do this extra step to decompress it. Because these are opaque uh, compression schemes, meaning if I run something through Snappy or, G, or Z standard, the bytes come out, I, the data system doesn't know what those bytes mean. And I can't jump to arbitrary offsets with them and to go find data I'm looking for. I got to decompress the whole block. And again, this made sense in 2013, 2012, when, when these file formats were designed because disk was slow, network was slow. So if I can reduce the amount of data I have to go read you know, from, from some, some local storage and then bring it to my memory, then I'm willing to pay that CPU, CPU uh, cost. But things have changed a lot now. The, the CPU is actually the, one of the slower things. So this actually doesn't make sense anymore. All right. So all right. the additional metadata we can keep track of are the filters. So the only two types of filters that they would have are zone maps and, and bloom filters. Again, remember, even though the paper calls it a page index, what's the difference between an index and a, and a filter? An index tells you where something is and what, if it exists. A filter tells you something could exist or does exist. It doesn't tell you where it is, though. So a zone map is going to say, here's my min and max value. So I'm trying to find something within, within a given range. If it's in that min max range, then it exists, but I don't know where it is. I, I, I got to go sequential scan to find it. Whereas a B plus G would say, hey, you're at this offset, right? Uh, and w which we don't care about. So we already talked about zone maps. Uh, and again, by default, Parquet and Orchestra are in the zone maps in the header of uh, each group. You can store it in the file level, but I, I don't think that's on by default. And then for Bloom filters, uh, within each row group, they can keep track of whether a, a value could exist for a, for a given column. Again, a Bloom filter is a probabilistic data structure. It can tell you definitely that something does not exist, but it can tell you, it is, but it tell you that something may exist. That you can get false positives, but not false negatives. Yes? The question is, why does it matter, matter whether values are clustered for a Bloom filter? Um, because the, the, how do I say this? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know why I wrote that. Like, it doesn't matter what order you insert yeah. it once it's there. Yeah, so because you, you hash it and, and it's scattered. You have multiple, like, multiple Bloom filters like, in different parts of the, of the data. So if you have the clusters, then you can select Bloom filter on which one part. 
you know, this, this, might, be, this might be for this, right? right? This, this, yeah, this, should, sorry, this is a typo. This should be for this. Zone map, it matters with the cluster because now you, you, the range will be much smaller and I can throw things out, right? If it's, if it's zero to infinity, then that's a useless zone map. Yeah, sorry, this should be for this. Thank you. Um, real quick, the split, split block bloom filter is basically a way to, uh, say if, you're, if your bloom filter is so many, so many bits, instead of having your hash functions look at any possible number of bits, you basically narrow it down to, to, a, to a block or subset of it. And so, and that means you can bring it in within a single cache line. We'll cover cache line stuff in, later on, but like, it's a way to just reduce the, uh, to keep everything in like L1 to run as fast as possible. All right, um, this part's a bit tricky. I, I'll do what I can on, on the time, but uh, the nested data structure is also really important. Um, we'll cover the Dremel system later on, but there's this paper uh, from, from, I think, 2011, 2010, uh, about the system called Dremel, which is a precursor to what, or it is the, inter Dremel's the internal name for BigQuery. Um, so we'll read those papers. But they talk about how back, back then, that like at Google, when they were building uh, Dremel, they had all these applications generating these proto protocol buffer d data that's all nested and semi-structured and, and, and inconsistent schemas, and they needed a way to efficiently uh, process them. So the Dremel paper talks about using this technique called uh, record shredding, which is mentioned in the paper you guys read, um, and it, this is an alternative, considered a better approach to the, uh, what ORC does and other, uh, other systems do called length and presence, presence encoding. Um, so we can cover this again net, later if necessary. But the basic idea with shredding is that, again, instead of storing the, the, the semi-structured data that I have as a single blob in, in my, as a, you know, a blob column, that I then have to parse every single time I want to do processing on it, I'm going to split it up so that every level in, my, in a path is now treated or as, a, as a separate column. And now I can rip through those columns to say, you know, if I need to find, like, you know, for a given field in, in, my, in, my, in my JSON file, does it have this attribute set to a certain value? Like, I can rip through that column and find it without having to parse everything uh, every single time. So the idea with, with shredding is that instead of keeping track of the explicit uh, hierarchy of, of, of a tuple, uh, or sorry, of a document for a given tuple, I just, I stored, I stored some repetition and a uh, definition column that tells me whether this thing exists for some tuple at some offset uh, for, as, as I'm scanning along, right? So the basic idea is that, say I have some protobuf definition like this, there's always a, a document ID at, at the top level, so I have a separate column for that, and that's always going to be there, and therefore the repetition and definition is always zero, because it's the only one integer, one doc ID per document, there's no repetition, and then it's, uh, there's no definition saying that there's other things I need to look at from the, from the other nested columns. But then you see here that the, within the, 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 the name field, I can have a language, I have a code, I always have this optional string URL, and then I can define now a separate column for all these things, and this is telling me the repetitions like for how many tuples after, after the run you're looking at, uh, am I, am, am I, do I belong to the original tuple that, that or the, the original tuple that, that was created at the top of the hierarchy. I'm going through this way fast. Uh, we, we'll, we can cover this more next, next, next class. The basic idea is, again, the, I have some additional metadata, these additional columns I'm using to keep track of that I can use to reverse and figure out what, where I'm at in my hierarchy. The easier one is, is the length and presence. This one basically says that as, I, as, as, as I'm scanning through my document, I'm generating the, the, the data, that if a tuple doesn't have a, an attribute, then at, at a given level, then I'll just set its presence to false and leave a blank space. So I'm always putting in blank spaces for optional data to know whether this, this, this given tuple, as I reconstruct things, exists or not. And that way I can just do the offsets to say, okay, well, uh, I know as I'm processing along, as I scan through, you know, how to reverse, use the presence to tell me reverse back to what, where I'm looking for because the offsets are gonna match up. Again, I'm, and, and butchering this, going through fast, but basically, again, the main takeaway here is that I can split things up and based on the past in my JSON document and then run all the encoding compression stuff that we did before. All right, to finish up quickly, uh, I'm going to show uh, one experiment from the paper you guys read. Uh, what we basically did was, rather than just looking at synthetic data, like from TPCDS or these other uh, benchmarks you guys are going to see in a bunch of papers and the Microsoft people guys used, we said, okay, let's go find a bunch of real data. Let's go find random Parquet files or random data sets, load this up in Parquet and Oracle, 
and then understand like are the design decisions that these file formats make are these good for real data, right? So, and as I said, there's a bunch of Parquet org files, or sorry, not work, a bunch of Parquet files you can find on GitHub, on the internet, through Hugging Face. We basically download a bunch of these things and then load it up. And so for our evaluation, for the most part, we're going to use Arrow C++ implementation of Parquet and Orc. Um, even though Parquet and Orc, were the, the original file library, the, the, the support libraries to process those files and, and create them, it's all written in Java because the Hadoop world wrote everything in Java from 10 years ago. Um, you know, we wanted to have the, the best performing implementations you could have, so we use C++. But the problem is, like, the uh, the file specs for this, for these, you know, for Parquet and Orc, they have all these new things that they've added over the years that are defined as optional, like the page index for the, the zone map in the in the footer is optional, and so the the various implementations of these formats, uh, sort of these processing libraries, some of them implemented things, some things didn't, and then there's just the implementation of things that are required. How, how high performance were those? Uh, and so in the case of Parquet and Orc, when we looked at like, uh, you know, like stuff in Rust and other implementations, they didn't have SIMD support, or like Parquet was really good, but Orc was really crappy. Like it was really hard for, for us to find like a sort of true apples apples comparison uh, between these different formats. Because right? just everyone sort of writes their own thing over the years. All right, so the first question we need to ask is, like, okay, well, how well do these things actually compress? Um, and the, the x-axis is just showing a bunch of different workloads that, that, we, that we, we, we generated for based on real, real data sets. Um, and see for the, you see that for the most part, Parquet is better for the, the, the logging and the ML workload than over Parquet, because like, you want lower is better. Um, because these, are, these data sets are comp mostly comprised of floating point numbers. Right? All the weights from some ML, you know, ML model, they're all, they're all floating point numbers. And because Parquet, does dictionary encoding for floating point numbers, you actually get a big win. Again, that seems counterintuitive. Seems, this was surprising to me that like floating point data actually compresses really well through dictionary encoding. And then uh, the ORC is going to do better for, for the, the classic workload and the, the geospatial workload because they mostly contain strings and Parquet, sorry, ORC is more aggressive in, in compressing the dictionary encodes. Right? It has about four different schemes it can use after you've already done the dictionary encoding. All right, so, so the file size, you know, these aren't huge wins, right? These aren't mind-blowingly different, right? These are, in my opinion, the margin of error, right? It's not like one's 10x larger than another, right? And as you said, storage is infinite. But now when you actually run the, you know, uh, queries on these things, right, simulating what an, an actual query engine would actually do uh, for scans and range scans, or sorry, full sequential scans and then uh, partial selects um, and point queries, you see, Parquet is going to be faster because it's going to mostly use bit packing. Uh, and for, the, for, for some of these workloads, there isn't a lot of repetition that are you know, for contiguous values. There's repetition within the column, but it's not like you see 1, 1, 1, 1 over and over again. So RLE doesn't, doesn't have a big win for this. Because right? again, they only, RLE only kicks in in Parquet if there's eight, eight or more repeated values. And so ORC is more aggressive for RLE. Right, again, three or more, but the problem is when you use rung length encoding, you can't vectorize that very easily with SIMD. And I don't I think the, I don't like the error implementation of, of the ORC processing uh, library that we had. None of that was vectorized, so you basically left doing SysD operations or SysD instructions on columnar vectorized data. Right. The other thing problem we saw with the case of ORC, and again, this would be a reoccurring theme throughout the entire semester, is that the additional complexity of supporting four different encoding schemes. For, for, for the dictionary codes, or you know, dic dictionary compressed columns, is that at runtime, as you're trying to rip through the column, you've got to keep checking, OK, for, the, you know, for this column chunk, how is it actually being encoded? And then now you have this, this, this branching in your code to say, if, if I look at my header, it says it's encoded this way, then I, I want to use this, you know, this function to decompress it. If it's this way, use this other function. And all that, uh, all that indirection or, or conditional clauses Calls us branch misprediction in the, in the CPU, which, in again, in a modern architecture with a superscalar uh, CPU architecture, is terrible because you've got to flush the pipeline and pause and all that garbage, right? So, for that reason, Parquet, because it's much more simple, works way better. And we'll see in some cases when we talk about sequential scans uh, and, and actually applying predicates, the stupid thing of like just always applying the predicate, uh, sorry, always copying the tuple as like, 
always copying the tuple into your output buffer, and then apply the predicate, actually works faster in some cases than checking the predicate, and then if it matches, then put it in your output buffer. So always copying seems like be the wrong thing to do, but on, on super scalar CPUs, when everything's in memory, you're trying to rip through as fast as possible, it turns out to, turns out to be the better choice. And this is why the compilation and the specialization stuff we'll see later on is going to make, help us as well, because now we don't have like, these giant switch calls that says, if I'm in 32, do, do this. If I'm you know, floating point, do that. Which again, if you ever look at the bus stop code or at Postgres and all that, that's basically what it looks like when they process types. So if you can specialize all of that, then you avoid that, that indirection. So that's why Parquet's simplicity is, is going to help it here. All right, I'm well over time. Let me finish quickly. So main takeaways of this, dictionary encoding is effective for all types, not just strings. And again, to me, this is surprising. The, the simple, simplistic encoding scheme it actually is better for modern hardware, as I just said. And then because the, the hardware landscape has changed so much, where network has gotten so much faster, uh, then it, then, and even disk has gotten much faster too, then it's, we just want to avoid using Snappy and Z standard entirely. The, the, in, the sort of native encoding schemes or dictionary encoding, RLE and all that, that's, that's always going to be better. All right, I've already said this, hardware has changed. Um, and then the, even though they're, they're, they're been widely successful, they're used everywhere, there's a lot of things that are missing in Parquet and Work that they didn't consider when they first designed these things. Um, that, that would help us if we want to process OLAP queries. So there's no statistics. There's just zone maps and tuple counts and bloom filters. No histograms, no sketches, nothing about what's inside those columns that I could use for, for cardinality estimations in my query optimizer. I can't, increment, can't incrementally de deserialize the schema. If I, if I, if I have 10,000 columns, I've got to deserialize that protobuf thing at the very beginning all at once. And then, as I said, there's a bunch of different limitations. And pick whatever query language, sorry, whatever programming language you want. There's a Parquet library for it, but it, like it doesn't. They're all. I'm not saying they're all garbage, but like they all, all, none of them supports exactly what's in the spec. Even the Java one doesn't. Okay, so next class you're gonna read fast lanes. We'll cover better blocks. These are gonna be sort of modern encoding schemes that go beyond the things we talked about today. And that's gonna be really designed for modern hardware. And the fast lane one is wild because it's basically saying, hey, if you don't put things in the order that they, in, in, in memory, in the way that they're found, somebody inserted them, you know, not even sorting it, but if you store things a certain way that, because that, you know it's going to be processed with SIMD, then you can get much better performance. It's pretty wild. Okay? Any last questions? Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't no puzzle, I'll guzzle cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cross, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, you just don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the paint is red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the chili cheese, sit down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of St. Pie.